It is indeed a pleasure to be here uh, for Alex's birthday. Uh, I guess everyone has uh, their own uh, personal story of uh, how they uh, came to work with Alex. Uh, uh, the first time I met Alex was in 1993 at the ICPIC meeting in Aarhus uh, in Denmark. Uh, that was soon after I joined uh, Gerd Billing uh, as a postdoc in University of Copenhagen. Uh, so I had a poster based on my PhD work uh, that was on uh, helium H2 plus scattering uh, using very packet methods. Uh, uh, and my, uh, so I decided to present this as a poster, and my PhD supervisor was also there, Dr. Satyamurthy. Uh, Alex came to the poster. I didn't know about Alex at uh, that time. And uh, so we had a, a brief uh, discussion about, uh, about the work. And after Alex left, uh, Professor Satyamurthy told me that if you ever want to do another postdoc, he would be a person, person to contact. So that was in 1993. And uh, about three years later, two and a half years later, when uh, I, uh, you know, I completed my postdoctoral work with Billing, um, I was thinking what to do next. And uh, and again, uh, so I had this uh, uh, this uh, you know advice my uh, uh, PhD supervisor gave, uh, and I had some opportunity to to go back to India at that time, but I wasn't really sure uh, if that is what I wanted to do. So I decided to write to Alex. So I wrote to him, uh, asking if he has a postdoc position. Uh, and uh, so there was no news for about a couple of months. Uh, uh, then I got an email from him uh, inviting me, uh, essentially offering a position. Uh, actually, wording was something like this. Uh, the position is for one year, but I'm optimistic that, uh, that uh, I can support you for three years. So. so um, so I was a little concerned, uh, really, what happens if, you know, if there is no funding after the first year. So I wrote him again, can you uh, uh, sort of uh, um, make a more firmer commitment that, uh, that he would be able to support me for three years? Uh, so Alex said, uh, um, I'm optimistic that I can uh, support you, but I cannot promise. Uh, and uh, now, actually, I realize uh, uh, that, uh, of course, uh, you know, no one can do that. And, uh, and I really appreciate Alex for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to come and work with you and, uh, and be part of this uh, larger family. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, project Alex suggested at that time uh, was to uh, look at some issues related to hot atoms in the atmosphere. Uh, thermalization of energetic atoms and issues related to nitric oxide formation in the, in the thermosphere. Uh, so I started uh, working on that and uh, considering my background in uh, collisions and reactive scattering, so that, uh, that was an appropriate uh, uh, topic to begin with. And I had very productive interaction with Vasily uh, on uh, some of those work. And that was also the time uh, around here in Cambridge, as well as at many other places in this country, uh, the beginning of uh, the uh, research on cold molecules, exciting experimental work in creating ultra-cold molecules using uh, photo association and other techniques. Uh, and uh, uh, issues, some of them highlighted uh, earlier this morning, about uh, 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 stability of uh, vibration excited molecules at uh, uh, ultra cold temperatures through uh, the collisional relaxation. Uh, Alex asked me, uh, "Do we know anything about uh, uh, about how quickly these uh, these molecules could undergo uh, vibrational relaxation?" It might be interesting to calculate some of these uh, processes. Uh, so it was really a completely new field. I had, uh, 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 you know, uh, there have been some of these studies at the high temperatures, but really nothing existed up to that point on. Uh, on uh, cold collisions. So, uh, so that was sort of a diversion for me from uh, some of the things I was doing, but it was uh, an exciting and, uh, and, and interesting diversion. So uh, we begin, begin to do both uh, these upper atmospheric work as well as the cold collision work. And, uh, and, and so even now uh, at UNLB, we continue some of this work. In fact, uh, uh, both directions are, uh, are, are being pursued. And uh, so uh, I thank NSF for the continued support of uh, uh, some of this research. So this is a brief overview of uh, what I would like to talk about. Uh, uh, I will give an out, uh, uh, some uh, highlight some of the initial research that we had on uh, rotational vibrational relaxation of uh, 
molecules at uh, low temperatures uh, and also give you some flavor of uh, some of the results on reactive scattering calculations that we did. Mostly we looked at reactions involving energy barriers which uh, proceed via tunneling at low temperatures. Uh, we looked at the effect of rotational vibration excitation of uh, the molecule on reactivity at low temperatures, how reactivity is, uh, uh, is influenced by uh, these, uh, uh, these factors. And uh, more recently, we, uh, we are also looking at reactions that uh, do not involve an energy barrier. Uh, there have been some studies of, uh, several studies of uh, alkali metal atom dimer systems uh, uh, on, uh, which, which do not involve energy barrier, but uh, there aren't uh, that many calculations, or any calculations on uh, non-alkali um, uh, metal systems uh, at cold temperatures. Uh, and I will also talk about uh, briefly some ongoing work on molecule-molecule uh, uh, collisions uh, 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 that is in collaboration with Roman. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the photo association creates molecules in excited vibration levels, and uh, the collisional quenching of these molecules uh, uh, has been an interesting uh, issue, and I guess it uh, still is an, is an interesting uh, topic, uh, and as well as the uh, whether chemical reactions occur and how we can control uh, chemical reactions, uh, uh, um, uh, which seems to be actually uh, quite exciting uh, in the direction that Roman uh, talked about uh, today. So these are some of the uh, topics that, uh, uh, that, that we are pursuing right now. And uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, 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 systems that we looked at. Uh, Again, most of these calculations are carried out using the Arthur's del Gardner formalism, which uh, uh, Roman has uh, uh, briefly discussed uh, um, uh, in his talk. So mostly, uh, my talk is going to be uh, qualitative, uh, highlighting some of the uh, interesting results that, uh, that uh, came out of this, uh, this work. So what is shown here is the vibrational relaxation rate constants for H2 uh, in various vibrational levels, uh, vehicle 1 to vehicle 10 in collisions with helium. So up to the point when we were, while we were doing the calculations, uh, most of uh, what has been known was around uh, this temperature range where uh, some measured data uh, are available and uh, our calculations, though I did not include here, the calculations for the vehicle one uh, agree quite well, well with the experiments, but only uh, in this range uh, uh, of temperatures. So uh, this seems to be the typical case of vibrational relaxation rate constants for these Van der Waals uh, systems such as helium H2 where the rate constant would decrease with the uh, decrease in temperatures, then begin to show this upturn and eventually um, uh, begin to uh, level or uh, actually attain the Wigner limit. And Alex knew all of this. This is ex exactly what uh, it should happen. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, so it was interesting to see the calculations uh, show the same. And uh, so in this case, the vibrational excitation has uh, uh, has uh, 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 some effect on uh, on the rate constants. Uh, so between vehicle one and ten, about two orders of magnitude uh, uh, increase. Uh, the another uh, system that we looked at is the helium CO. So the choice of some of these system is partly because there have been experiments or calculations at higher temperatures, uh, but uh, and, and these are also relatively simpler system, uh, fairly accurate potential surfaces uh, were available. But there was also the other interest that these system, systems are all, all, of astrophysical interest. So uh, we have been able to do calculations in, uh, at low temperatures as well as at temperatures relevant to astrophysical environments. Uh, and so quite extensive work has been done on, on, on these systems. And uh, many of the calculations are, are, are subsequently done in collaboration with the Phil Stansel uh, and also with Bob Foray. So this is for the helium CO system. Uh, we looked at vibrational relaxation in the vehicle to one vibration level for two different initial rotational levels, J equal to zero and one. Uh, again, for both initial states, uh, the result is uh, the rate constant is uh, essentially the same uh, at higher temperatures, but there are some sub substantial differences uh, 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 as the temperature is decreased. Uh, the feature here, uh, shown here, uh, essentially comes from the uh, presence of these uh, shape presences in the cross section. So when you integrate it over a Boltzmann distribution of relative velocities, uh, then that leads to this uh, local enhancement. Uh, and in the case of the vehicle to one, J equal to one, there is a, 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 a nearly two orders of magnitude increase in the rate constant in the Wigner regime and uh, uh, at this temperature regime. And that appears to be coming from a fish back resonance uh, that exists very close to the channel, opening of the J equal to one uh, rotational level of the CO molecule 
and the fish back resonance was not present for the JQL0 case. So certain differences in the, in the uh, interaction potential can cause quite dramatic uh, uh, change uh, in the low temperature values of the rate constants. Uh, so uh, then we thought uh, it would be interesting to look at uh, uh, chemical reactions because there has been quite a lot of talk about superchemistry uh, possibility of observing chemical reactions at low temperatures. And, uh, and again, we went back to a system that has been quite well studied at, uh, uh, at high temperatures and uh, both experimentally and, and uh, theoretically in the chemical physics community. So this is uh, after HH2, one of the most widely studied chemical reactions. Uh, and uh, it involves a small energy barrier of about 500 Kelvin. Um, so the reaction proceeds via tunneling at low temperatures. Uh, uh, it has a, a fairly large exo edge city, so the uh, reaction would populate uh, uh, these excited vibration levels of the HF molecule. And actually, the V prime equal to 2 is the most uh, po uh, probable uh, vibration level of the product HF molecule, which also is the reason for the HF uh, chemical laser. Um, so that, uh, what we found using a potential surface developed by Stark and Werner, which is uh, considered to be the most uh, accurate potential surface for F plus H2 at that time, it reproduces most of the experimental uh, features of the reaction uh, 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 from uh, the energy threshold to, to several hundred Kelvin. Uh, the rate constant at, uh, at, uh, at, at zero temperature limit is uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 12 cubic centimeter per second uh, from our calculation. Uh, which is comparable to the magnitude of the rate constant at uh, about room temperatures. Uh, so that is a, 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 a fairly a large value for a, a reaction rate constant that occurs in the limit of uh, zero temperature. The F plus H2 reaction is also, uh, it was referred to a couple of days, uh, in the first day of the meeting, uh, of its importance in HF, HF formation in interstellar medium. So mainly it is due to this reaction that most of the fluorine exists in the form of HF uh, in uh, interstellar uh, me medium. Um, the F plus H2 reaction in the tunneling regime occurs by tunneling of the, of the hydrogen atom, uh, which, uh, we, which we, uh, being a light atom is quite probable. Uh, Roman talked about the Li plus HF uh, in the electric field induced uh, changes in the reactivity. So an interesting case here is that uh, the, there is only one channel that is open at low, temp low energies. The other channel that for involves the transfer of hydrogen atom, the LiH plus F, is energetically closed at low, low energies. So, so we have only this channel. And this reaction also has small energy barriers. So in fact, the reaction occurs by tunneling of the fluorine atom here. Uh, so the calculations, uh, this is again only s wave scattering in the incident channel for vehicle zero and vehicle one. Blue curve is the reactive uh, cross-section as a function of the energy. Uh, these oscillations correspond to resonances in the, uh, uh, due to the decay of LIHF van der Waals complex formed in the entrance channel. And uh, the uh, blue curve here is the reactive cross-section. The red curve is the non-reactive vibration of quenching cross-section. So again, even though it involves uh, tunneling of the heavier fluorine atom, the, it is the reactive channel that dominates at uh, low energies. Again, uh, at higher uh, you know, energies, one has to include the effect of higher angular momenta uh, uh, to compute the full total cross-section. But this shows only the S-wave uh, contribution. So there have been uh, quite a number of studies uh, by us uh, uh, from Franco's group, some of them jointly with Alex on, uh, on uh, isotopes of the uh, F plus H2 reaction, as well as on other systems. Uh, uh, so, but most of these reactions uh, involve energy barrier. They occur through tunneling at low temperatures. But there have not been um, any studies of uh, atom to atom exchange reactions that uh, are non-alkali metal systems and that do not involve an energy barrier. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, based on some results uh, on the alkali systems, uh, such a reaction should proceed by a, a very large rate constant at low temperatures. Uh, so that is uh, what we are actually uh, currently trying to uh, look at to uh, study complex forming reactions uh, which do not involve any energy barrier. But it is also a, a lot more challenging because of the large number of uh, rotational vibration levels that one has to include uh, uh, in, the, in the calculations. Uh, so obviously, there are some vested interest in, uh, in looking at a system such as the O plus OH, uh, uh, because it is of interest in mesospheric OH chemistry, where OH is a K 
catalytic, a destroyer of ozone, so uh, uh, the density of OH in the mesosphere is, is partly uh, related to the rate constant of that reaction. There is quite a bit of interest in astrophysical environments uh, related to the uh, formation of molecular oxygen and the oxygen chemistry. And, and, uh, and I will show you uh, there is quite a bit of uncertainty in the magnitude of the rate constant for the reaction at low temperatures. Uh, there are uh, uncertainties in the measurements, uncertainties in the calculations. Uh, and, uh, and it is also uh, quite uh, uh, interesting uh, from the cold collision point of view uh, because OH has been cooled and trapped by the stark deceleration methods. Uh, uh, maybe the, uh, there are progress being made using the buffer gas cooling method. And uh, so it would be, in fact, I guess an interesting case for cold, uh, cold chemistry as well. And uh, so uh, jointly with Brian Kendrick at Los Alamos National Lab, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, started uh, uh, um, or we, we, yeah, we uh, began to look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, this reaction. And as a, uh, as a starting point of our studies on more complex uh, 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 barrier, barrierless uh, chemical reactions. So there are really uh, not any reliable experimental data on this reaction for temperatures below. 40 Kelvin, and uh, it is also uh, uh, yeah, like due to the strong dipole quadrupole interaction between oxygen and the OH, uh, the long range uh, interaction potential is quite important in this system. And obviously, uh, you know, Alex uh, has already um, identified, along with the others, uh, some of the key, key reactions of interest in. Uh, in shock heated gases that involve oxygen and hydrogen. So, uh, so here, uh, so the, the O plus uh, OH and the H plus O2, so we are looking at the, uh, the reactions uh, from both sides. Uh, and uh, earlier we have done uh, some calculations on, the, uh, on the, o, the reverse process, the O plus H2, mostly from atmospheric uh, chemistry uh, interest. So this is uh, the, uh, so the, the, the method that we are using is uh, a hyperspherical coordinate method uh, based on uh, the formalism developed by Russ Pack and, uh, and Parker. Uh, it is called the adiabatically adjusting principal axis hyperspherical code or abbreviated as the APH. So what is shown here is the, uh, is the, uh, the adiabatic energy is uh, as a function of the hyperradius. Uh, the O plus OH would be this side, and as it comes in, you can see, I mean, there is really no energy barrier, and this deep HO2 complex is formed. Uh, and as a result, there are like thousands of rotational vibration levels one has to include. Uh, this is just for the total J equals zero, and, uh, uh, and, and asymptotically, it corresponds to various or vibrational energy levels of the molecule. And, and so, uh, and again, due to this large number of uh, 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 bound states of the, uh, bound or quasi-bound states of the, uh, HO2 species, the reaction involves uh, or leads to very narrow resonances. So, so um, again, uh, we um, are using potential electronic, you know, uh, electronically adiabatic potential surfaces calculated by the chemists. Uh, uh, there are uh, two potentials uh, uh, that we used. Uh, again, these are very preliminary calculations, ongoing work. Uh, uh, one is the DIM-KP. DIM stands for diatomics and molecules. KP stands for Kendrick and Pack. Uh, that potential, uh, uh, we believe it is a more accurate potential, at least in the low energy regime, because it includes the right long range forces. Uh, but the other one used uh, more widely in the chemistry community uh, uh, is the XXZLG, which uh, is the, you know, the initial of the five authors involved in that work. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, so here I show, uh, I don't know if uh, you can see, distinguish the colors clearly. Uh, the red curve is the result of uh, these authors. Uh, uh, they used uh, actually a yes, very similar hyperspherical coordinate uh, uh, formalism developed by Jan Michel Laune. Uh, and, and in fact, I think these are the only two codes uh, which can uh, really uh, very well handle complex forming reactions. Uh, and so the black curve is our results on this XSCLG potential surface. Uh, and you can see they are essentially on top of each other. So, this, each other, so the agreement is uh, quite good. Uh, uh, this is a result on the other potential, the diatomic and molecule potential. Uh, and uh, due to the differences uh, in, the, in, the, in the interaction potentials, obviously the results are different. Uh, and that also shows you the challenge, like how, uh, how difficult it is uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, to quantitatively or uh, to calculate, to qu quantitatively calculate 
potential energy surfaces for these systems. Uh, so anyway, we were we are quite pleased that uh, that uh, the calculations uh, reproduce uh, you know from both cores uh, uh, produce identical nearly identical results. So now. Um, to calculate rate constants, of course, one has to do calculations of uh, reaction probabilities for all uh, the angular momentum partial waves that contribute. And uh, that is, uh, for high angular momenta, it is almost uh, impossible for this reaction. And that is also why this is one of the very, very few uh, uns well, um, uh, reactions that the chemical physics community is still uh, not able to, uh, to, uh, to handle uh, in terms of uh, uh, computing accurate rate constant without any, any dynamics approximation. So, so most calculations have uh, used some sort of approximation. And uh, the one that is widely used is what is called a J-shifting method, in which you calculate accurately the results for total angular momentum, J equal to zero, and then use a, an approximation called J-shifting, uh, through which you get results for higher angular momenta, which is actually not a very good approximation for this system because uh, uh, it doesn't have an energy barrier, and the jazz shifting method is more suitable for reaction with energy barriers. So anyway, the most uh, interesting thing I want to point out here is that the red curve is our result on this XXZLG, and the, uh, and the green curve is the result of the uh, of uh, Zhu et al., which was obtained by using the, the, uh, the results of the red curve here. In fact, that means we should get identical results uh, because uh, they seem to be on top of each other. Uh, but uh, for the rate constant, we see some big differences. Uh, and uh, we almost spent two months to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, so I'll explain it in the next slide. And the blue one is our result on the DIMKP. So again, uh, you see that uh, there are uh, even uh, the in this temperature range, the difference is not dramatic, but there are differences. Uh, uh, these, are, these are a sample of experimental data, including some NASA recommended values. Uh, uh, and these two data points are the most recent experimental data from the group of uh, uh, Cartier et al., that is the, I, the group of IWM Smith. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, this is 39 Kelvin. This is 120 Kelvin. Uh, seems to be, uh, you know, the, the rate constant seems to be almost independent of temperature. Uh, but uh, that is not what uh, this green curve shows. It shows a very rapid decrease in the rate constant with a decrease in temperature. And uh, uh, so at 10 Kelvin, the value uh, here is about nearly 80 times smaller than the, the value here. So that was a, a, a dramatic uh, uh, a drop in the rate constant. and. Uh, it appears that uh, the, it is very sensitive when you, when you have reaction probabilities or cross actions, and when you want to compute rate constant, you need to integrate it over a Boltzmann distribution uh, of, uh, of collision energies. And if that is not done accurately, and if you don't uh, include the threshold region uh, in the integration process, and if you don't have enough resolution in the energy dependence of the reaction probability, then uh, you know, uh, a lot of things can go wrong, and uh, and so I believe uh, so. So that's what uh, we found. Uh, th these are uh, these various curves are our calculations, but it, which uses different uh, degrees of energy resolution computing the reaction probability. So there are the set one, set two, set three corresponds to increasing big degrees of energy resolution, and the set four is the set three plus this uh, low energy regime, which actually makes an important contribution for this. Uh, the IMKP potential, which has the more extended long-range description, but it doesn't actually make a big difference for the uh, for the other potential. You can see the blue one and the and the dark curve is uh, uh, essentially on top of each other. So this makes about an uh, about a factor of four difference, uh, and uh, and and then uh, if you don't include the threshold region, then of course uh, uh, most of you know the rate constant will decrease substantially, and and we believe. That was the main source of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, substantially smaller value of reaction uh, rate constant uh, uh, calculated by the other authors. So anyway, so this is a work in progress. Uh, we have submitted a manuscript as a communication to JCP, which is still being reviewed. But there was one of the uh, the referees asked precisely, well, if you are using the same methods, then why is that? Uh, uh, that that we get a very different result from uh, 
uh, at low temperatures compared to the other ones. So, uh, so that is the, how we ended up looking at these things, and uh, and, and hope we will uh, hear from the uh, from them uh, from the journal soon. Uh, okay. So uh, the other thing that we are oh, how many three minutes? Oh, yeah, I think that's enough. Uh, so I briefly want to discuss uh, some ongoing work on molecule-molecule collisions, which uh, uh, also is important uh, uh, in uh, ultra-cold traps when you have high densities of molecules. Molecule-molecule uh, uh, -molecule collisions are also inter uh, of interest in uh, as physical environments, uh, especially in H2 dominated regions. Uh, and uh, uh, and there, there have been some, uh, you know, quite a bit of studies of uh, rotational excitations in H2H2 -H2 collisions. Uh, but uh, there aren't uh, that many calculations of uh, raw vibrational transitions in H2H2 -H2 collisions at uh, temperatures of uh, interest in astrophysical environments. Uh, and uh, so jointly with Roman, uh, we have been working on, uh, on developing a, a, a full dimensional quantum scattering code to treat uh, 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 diatom diatom collisions. And so now we have a code that is uh, jointly uh, uh, developed with Roman crimes uh, on uh, H2H2 -H2 system, which Roman likes to call 2BC. And uh, so I will show you some uh, illustrative results. And again, the approach is uh, uh, based on the Arthur Ar Gardner formalism, uh, which is an extension of his, uh, his method he developed for rigid order uh, 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 collisions by including vibrational degrees of freedom of both molecules. So, uh, so again, uh, uh, these, uh, these kind of uh, calculations uh, uh, are, are most uh, conveniently done using the arthur dahl garner formalism. So what I want to highlight here is uh, uh, some interesting results. Uh, we have three uh, 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 initial states for the H2H2 -H2 system. Uh, uh, in one case, uh, in all, th all, all three cases, I have one molecule in vibrationally excited. In the other case, uh, vibrationally ground state, but the rotational uh, levels are different in the three cases. And uh, these initial states are labeled as 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, these numbers correspond to the, uh, the vibrational rotational quantum numbers of both molecules. So the elastic cross-section is almost ins uh, uh, insensitive to the initial states uh, shown here, but the inelastic vibrational relaxation cross-section is quite sensitive to the initial state. Uh, it is quite low in the, in, in the first case. Uh, it is uh, somewhat intermediate for the uh, case where you have the, uh, the uh, molecule is rotationally excited, and it is much larger uh, for the case where you have one molecule vibrationally excited and the other molecule rotationally excited. And uh, so the uh, such a dramatic difference in vibrational relaxation cross-section uh, was initially puzzling, but it turns out that in molecule-molecule collisions, it is uh, dictated by two factors. One is the conservation of internal energy, that is, if the internal combined vibrational and rotational energy is, uh, is the same before and after the collision, so we have a near resonant process. And if the, if the uh, internal rotational angular momentum, some of the rotational angular momentum of uh, the two molecule is also conserved during the collision, then becomes a highly efficient near resonant process. And exactly that is what's happening here. We have the initial state is 1, 0, 0, 2, but after collision it goes to 1, 2, 0, 0. And what is plotted is cross section as a function of what we call the, uh, the combined molecular state, where the internal energy increases in this direction. So you can see the energy gap between the two, uh, two uh, uh, states uh, is very small, and it's, uh, it's about 25 Kelvin. So it is not exactly resonant, but it is near resonant. But that condition is not satisfied here. You can see the most uh, possible final, the initial state is uh, 1, 2, 0, 0, but the most probable final state is 1, 0, 0, 0. So that corresponds to a pure rotational uh, transition. And in this case, this is the initial state. So this corresponds to the, the, the elastic scattering, but there is no preferred final state in that. So we don't have this uh, uh, near resonant process. And uh, finally, the uh, near resonance process is also uh, maintained, or it is uh, also present when you have vibrationally excited uh, molecule. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the case. So three types of initial conditions, V0, V prime 0, V2, V prime 0, V0, V prime 2. These are the initial rotational and vibrational combinations of the two molecules. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and when the near resonance process is uh, present, uh, uh, the cross-sections are very large, and, and these, these cross-sections are calculated at a collision energy of a microkelvin. So uh, again, this is a work in progress, and, uh, 
Um, and uh, some conclusions from this study. Uh, um, <clears throat> so so I, I think uh, we are uh, at a time where exciting developments are taking place in uh, both in theory and experiments. Uh, Roman has uh, shown uh, how these collisions can be controlled using electric and magnetic field. And uh, some of the calculations I showed here that uh, in chemical reactions, one may have a large rate constant, uh, uh, rate coefficient uh, for barrierless reactions. Uh, and also, the, um, the, uh, uh, for the case of molecule-molecule collisions, one can have interesting near resonant transitions. So, so I'd like to thank my collaborators. Uh, um, uh, uh, some of them are listed here, and, uh, except Brian and, uh, and, and my uh, postdocs, uh, Gulman and uh, Philip. Uh, all of them are here. Um, um, so, so any, so, uh, well, Thanks once again for the opportunity to, to uh, talk about uh, uh, some of the things we are doing. Uh, and uh, once again, happy birthday, Alex. Uh, now the paper is open for discussions. Any question? No question? One question. So on these inelastic collisions that you discussed at the end, um, what, what are the chances of being able to extend to, to more complicated atoms? Say lithium or sodium collisions rather than uh, hydrogen. The, uh, the molecule molecule or the uh, or collision between say lithium, two lithium divers. Uh, the, well, uh, I guess we, we may be able to do for uh, S waves. Uh, it will, the limiting factor is uh, essentially the number of rotational vibration levels that we have to include in the calculation if you want to get some accurate uh, converged cross sections. But if you have, suppose there are some near resonant process such as the one that I just identified, then the calculation, the, the cross section between those near resonant levels will be so dominant that uh, transition between all other levels will be not very important. So if we, if on, of course, only if we do the calculations, we will know. But, uh, but if we have such process occurring, uh, then uh, we will be able to do the calculations. But other, uh, because then we don't need to include all other channels in the calculations. Uh, but the question is, unless you do the calculation, it is difficult to know whether such a process would exist or not. Uh, um, uh, uh, you're, you're asking if the calculation like this would be, uh, how easy is it to do? And I, and I think the answer to that is that it, it, with the current technologies, it would be impossible, primarily because, you know, when it comes to alkali and metal dimers, these collisions involve chemical reactions. You know, like when we have two lithium dimers colliding, they're going to exchange atoms, unlike in collisions of H2 molecules. So these are barrierless chemical reactions. And you have, like, if you want to do a rigorous calculation, you have to include the reactive channels. And for a four-body collision problem, that's impossible. People have done at higher temperatures, but uh, uh, doing it for, for low temperatures where you have to integrate these equations to hundreds of atomic units uh, becomes. Uh, may, may I ask as a comment that in the group of Jean-Michel Launay, they are doing such calculations. Any other question? What are the prospects for extending uh, these near resonant calculations uh, to cases of higher J? Uh, uh, so, particularly uh, interested in transfer from uh, vibrational excitation to rotation. I, I, think, uh, the, I, I think that is where we are heading to uh, uh, some of this, uh, 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 you know, the H2H2. H2. We certainly want to look at the excited vibration levels and rotation levels, and uh, uh, that pros prospect is actually quite bright uh, that we will be doing it in the next uh, uh, year or two. And essentially, it is a computational uh, uh, problem now that, now that we have the, uh, 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 the code working. And, uh, uh, so, so the prospect is actually quite bright. <laughs>